All is right. My, my screen there. Okay, I'm good. All right. So good afternoon, everybody, and happy Friday. Happy Good Friday. Um, so thank you to all of you that were able to join us today. Um, I know there may have been some that were on a vacation day or a day off of work today, but we appreciate all of you being here with us today. And so today, again, we have Dr. Keith Johnson, and he's here today to talk about making quality hay crop silage and baleage. And so we're excited to learn more from you again today, Dr. Johnson. Well, thank you very much. It's a beautiful day here in West Lafayette, uh, albeit uh, a little cool, but the sun is shining and that's always nice. And it uh, actually feels warmer than what it actually is on the temperature. And I just wanted to start out uh, off topic uh, here for a minute. And uh, it did get cold last night. Um, I know um, as I looked at landscaping plants about me, and on campus, uh, they definitely took a, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a freeze quality to them. Uh, I think um, the good news is at least uh, probably cool season grasses aren't going to have any uh, worse for wear. Uh, I'm glad that it happened this week and not uh, in 10 days or so when the plants are starting to uh, be uh, growing even more and starting to uh, elongate seed heads and, and that sort of thing and floral parts. Um, but if you start seeing something next week that emerges from the uh, upper portion of the plant that looks bleached, that probably is uh, showing that there was some injury to some cells and they uh, passed, okay, they're dead. But uh, long-term, that's very, very minor. Um, if any of you had uh, issues or have issues that uh, look like the plant is totally not gonna be coming back uh, in the time frame of five days or so, uh, please let your extension educator in your county know or uh, pass on that information to me, please. Okay, well, let's uh, get started with the uh, topic that we are here today, and it is making quality hay crop silage and baleage. And my objective is to talk about the tips for making a quality chopped hay crop silage, which uh, you can see in this picture here in the left. And let me get to you a need, laser pointer. You need to share your screen, Keith. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yep, thanks. <laughs> Thought I'd done that. Share the screen. Okay. okay. We're good. <laughs> We're good. That's good. We're excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to discuss tips for making quality chopped hay crop silage and baleage. And the picture here that you see, and let me get the laser back on please to help us through this presentation. Um, that's what's showing here is that uh, we have some very nice uh, wheat uh, that's being, was laid down and is being chopped as you can see and is gonna end up in a, in a bag um, as chopped form. And I wanna spend some time today and probably the majority of you don't go through this process, but I think we do need to spend a bit of time about uh, what it takes to have uh, quality chop forage. And then we're gonna spend the majority of the time on uh, making baleage. And uh, this is an inline um, wrapper that you see here, wrapping bales uh, in place and forming that tube. And we'll make comments about, about baleage as we go along. Uh, I'd like to talk about the process of both making baleage and hay crop silage. Uh, I want to just go back in history a little bit because you hear the term haylage uh, thrown about a bit. That actually is a coined term by the Harvest Store Company uh, back probably in the 1960s or 1970s. And the reason it is those big blue tall towers that you see, uh, which are oxygen limiting, uh, were allowed one to make the crop at a a uh, little lesser moisture content than traditional silage and a higher moisture content than hay. And thus they coined the word hay ledge. And ledge of course is the, uh, is the last part of, of silage. And so when we talk about hay crop silage, um, it's, I'm looking at small grains uh, that can be harvested in the uh, green form uh, before grain formation occurs and then also perennial grasses and uh, legume forages. And actually uh, probably should have added and should have added uh, things such as uh, the annual warm season grasses like uh, sorghum sedan grass, okay? 
I would consider that, or Sudan grass to be another type of hay crop silage. But we start that process out with the mower conditioner, okay? And uh, we wanna get that uh, crimp to happen, as we talked about last week with hay, uh, this still is a good implement to crimp that crop and to get moisture loss to happen a little bit more rapidly than just with the use of a sickle bar type of mower. And then we chop, as we saw in the picture, we transport it and we can go to a bag where we're packing it uh, in a bag. Uh, people will loosely talk about that as, uh, as an ag type of bag, ag bag. Uh, blow it in a silo, okay, such as the tower silo, or then pack it in a bunker. So that's in the chop form. With the process of balings, we essentially can use the haymaking processes of a mower conditioner. Uh, may need to be tetted, uh, need to bring it back uh, into the form of a windrow. If conditions are really, really good in terms of uh, high solar radiation, uh, number of days projected not to rain, we actually can just lay that into a, a windrow and then come back and bale and then wrap that crop. So those are you know, the processes of making baleage and hay crop silage. I wanna talk about uh, fermentation and this is true whether we're talking about the chop form or whether we're talking about uh, the long form or the form of making baleage is the fact that we have five phases uh, associated with uh, fermentation. The first is the aerobic phase. The second is the lag phase. The third is the fermentation phase. And then we follow suit with the stable and the feed out phase. And if we take a look at this graphic, here we have a relative level of silage pH here, oxygen here, and the population of lactic acid producing bacteria. These are good bacteria. They are the ones that are producing a lactic acid that lower the pH that preserve this forage. Essentially, if you will, it's pickling the forage. So the first phase aerobic, of course, we uh, have an oxygen environment when we're chopping this. Uh, we want to deplete the oxygen, however, because this fermentation process is a anaerobic uh, process without oxygen. And so the aerobic phase is roughly only a day. And so we want to deplete the oxygen level so that we can increase uh, the production of these lactic acid producing bacteria that are anaerobic. And so we can see that the lag phase, and it's a lag because we have a slight rise, and then we've got an explosion of bacteria produced up until about day six or seven. And the silage pH, okay, is here and we're on the downward slope, okay, and then we get to a low level about day 14 onto day 21, where we hope that we've got a pH that keeps it such that this crop is going to be preserved for a very long time if we can keep oxygen in the air out. And then after that, we've got a stable phase. So if we keep the oxygen out, we can keep that pH to be uh, at a range that's ideal uh, for preservation. And then lastly, we get to the point that we're feeding the silage. And so that's the feed out phase. And uh, we'll make uh, some comments about uh, the feed out phase a little bit later. So that's what those graphs are about. We wanna reduce oxygen. We wanna increase uh, the population of the bacteria. They die off, okay, because they get to a point that the pH is so low that they can't uh, live. And, and so they die, they've done their job, if you will. Uh, I want to make a comment about this particular applicator here. Uh, this is uh, an inoculant applicator, and uh, you can put a dry product in here, calibrate it, and as the chop forage goes uh, into uh, the apparatus that's going to put it into the bag or as it blows up into the uh, silo, we're going to put an inoculant in that does have a population of bacteria that aids the process of fermentation. Now, frankly, I'm not necessarily a fan of doing this with corn silage because we have so much starch, right? We've got the grain. However, with these uh, forage crops, you know, the small grains uh, harvesting before we have uh, any bit of, of grain formation occurring quite often, uh, we don't have uh, carbohydrates and seed, hopefully, uh, that we're putting up in the form of legumes or these uh, cool season grasses or uh, warm season annual grasses. So as a result, this can be an aid. And I would say, as I've looked at research, 
it's probably at least a break-even uh, uh, proposition in utilizing a product like that uh, to be an aid, but it doesn't create magic either, okay? It's not going to make something that's crummy and make it wonderful by just doing an inoculation. Got to start out with a quality crop. So what's a, a wonderful silage and what's a crummy silage as we look at uh, the relative levels of pH, lactic acid, acetic acid, and butyric acid. Let me say, first of all, the target, the target pH for preservation for excellent fermentation is 4.5. Okay, so that's, uh, as you can see, it's, a, it's an acidic environment. And uh, if we have something that's higher than that, we have actually had a few cases, particularly with baleage in the last few years, that have had more pHs in the mid to upper fives associated also with other issues of poor crop quality and a little bit of soil that we've had some botulism cases uh, in the state of Indiana. And uh, I believe Kentucky has as well uh, in the region. And it all targets back to the fact that we have less than desirable uh, fermentation occurring. So again, this can be baleage, it can be chopped forage. But what happens is with excellent silage, is we have a strong amount of lactic acid, okay? And if you look at the x-axis, this is weeks after ensiling, okay? So this is day zero, and then we work out to seven days and on to uh, 56 days. So as we look at this, we have a strong amount of lactic acid. We have a, a moderate level of acetic acid. Of course, when I think about uh, using sensory analysis of silage, you know, a good smell is like opening the pickle jar, uh, like opening the apple cider vinegar. Uh, it's that type of smell. Uh, pH, uh, again, is going to decline and stay down at this level. That is good attribute of good silage. Poor silage, on the other hand, we have a decrease in pH, but then it rises back up to that high level that is not good for the stability of the silage. And uh, we have uh, relatively low, very low amounts of lactic acid, uh, which is a strong indicator of poor silage. We have a moderate level of acetic acid, and then you see no butyric acid up in the good silage, but down here in the poor silage, you can see that we have a large amount of butyric acid. And that's an indicator that this silage was probably made at too high of a moisture content, okay, is what, one of the things that happens in regards to uh, fermentation not being the greatest. Um, we can actually have an analysis for all these different uh, organic acids in uh, an analysis of the forage uh, and the pH as well. And I would encourage any of you that are uh, making baleage or chopped uh, forage to consider uh, the measurement of organic acids and pH, particularly if you do any at all, get a measure of pH and see if we're on target with uh, good, good and siling. Well, the hay crop silage structure that you use does dictate the target moisture. And so if we look at, a, at an upright, which I have listed here as the tower, okay, 63 to 68% moisture. The oxygen limiting, that's the, those blue towers that you see that are a fiberglass line. And uh, they actually uh, can be made, as I stated earlier, at a little less moisture content, 50 to 60%. If you're looking at a bunker, a trench, uh, or a bunker or a trench, uh, here's an example, of course, of a bunker silo. We can be at 65 to 72% moisture. And if you're going into a bag where the forage, again, this is chop forage, is we can be at 60 to 70%. Now, uh, a rule of thumb uh, that I use that really works well, I think, is to target whether I'm getting close, where I start getting serious about utilizing a moisture uh, analytical measure to really know where we're at, is to take a handful of that chop forage and squeeze it as hard as you can. And if you hold it up and you get drip, 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 you're still too wet. You're gonna have that butyric acid fermentation occurring and that's not where you wanna be. On the other hand, if you take that scoop of silage and you squeeze hard and you open your hand very slowly 
you'll see that that ball slowly breaks open. That's getting close to ideal around that 65% target level. And then we can uh, be more specific to make sure we're on that uh, level of moisture. If you squeeze and you open your hand and it just, bloop, you know, it splutes out, uh, you're way too dry. And, uh, you know, that can be problematic then because too dry is not ideal for uh, proper fermentation either. Regarding chop length, very, very critical that you measure chop length before you start getting serious about making chop forage because too coarse does reduce the pack quality. You want this forage to be tight. You want it to be dense. However, too fine will give you pack quality, but it reduces the chew factor, the effective fiber for the microorganisms in the rumen to make the most utilization of that forage. Penn State University developed uh, many years ago uh, a particle separator. And uh, there are three sieves that one can purchase along with a one that's on the bottom. And um, I think the one that I'm showing here is a two sieve with one on the bottom. At the time that these were first available, that's what they were. But I would advise anybody to get one that has the three sieves and the solid bottom as the place to be. And if we take a look then at what's ideal, uh, we find that with hay crop silage, the target in the upper sieve, okay, which has the big holes like we're seeing here, you wanna have 10 to 20% of that weight uh, of the sample that you that you shake. And this is a shake sort of method that you do. There's a right way to do this correctly. Um, not gonna take time today, but uh, anybody that does this uh, needs to follow the right protocol. The number of shakes, the, the, the how, how, how uh, hard you shake and so forth is, is important. But in the upper sieve, 10 to 20 is the target. The middle sieve, 45 to 75%. That's the majority of the forage that you want in that mid. And then the lower sieve, 20 to 30. And the fines, okay, that shake through, that last, that last sieve uh, is very, very small. And so you're getting the fines in the bottom pan that has, is uh, no, no sieve at all. We want less than 5%. So those are targets. And you can note for hay crop silage, the target is different as compared to corn silage, okay? And um, so that's, that's critical that we have the um, right amount in each of those ranges to make sure that we have the right kind of packing and at the right kind of moisture to make that happen. And so one would go into the field uh, with their chopper, uh, get a subsample, okay, and uh, collect it, and then do the shaken method with the Penn State particle separ separator. And if it's not right, you adjust. You either increase the length of cut or you shorten the length of cut so we can get in the target range. Okay, and then we've got the whole point of the feed out rate and silage removal. You'd like to be able to remove greater than four to six inches per day uh, to keep that fresh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, the aspect of, of air having effect on the face of that silo. We'd like to move at least four to six inches per day. And you wanna maintain a face that's clean, okay, uh, with uh, a silage stored in a bunker. And as you can see, we have a silage, what's called a silage facer here, that's uh, bringing the uh, silage down, which then will be picked up uh, by a skid steer loader, put into the uh, weigh apparatus as a part of the ration. Uh, but that is the ideal way uh, to be making this instead of just ramming into the, into the bunker and um, having that fall down and people have actually lost their lives when they're not uh, safe about this. And of course it exposes the face and we cause deterioration to the silage and storage as well. Within the forage field guide, and if you have not uh, purchased one, uh, we certainly have talked about this in this series quite often. I would encourage you to uh, consider that. There's a wealth of information in that particular publication. Uh, for those of you that uh, are in corporate uh, practice, uh, these can be purchased with your information uh, on the uh, front cover and on the back cover uh, as points of, of, of contact for you, uh, but a good information about two, 300 pages in length. And here's an example of this. We've got the practice, the reason of doing the practice, 
and the benefits of the practice with bag chopped silage. So we have that sort of interest in there regarding hay as well as baleage and so forth. So uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time looking at this today, but one thing I do wanna say, it is important here to have the right theoretical length of cup. And I'm just gonna go down here and say that with um, the theoretical length of cut, that's a chopper setting, is near three eighths for hay crop silage and for corn silage, it's set at a quarter inch or three quarter inch theoretical length of cut if you got a roll processor that's uh, uh, crushing, processing the kernels of corn. So each of these crops have a different theoretical length of, of chop and uh, would encourage you to measure that again before you really start the whole process of taking on the majority of the field acreage. Well, with that, uh, I'd like to transition to baleage. Um, probably most of you will have more use of that type uh, on your farm, but uh, I thought it was important to do the chop material as well. But uh, Alicia, let's see if there's any questions at this point regarding uh, chop forage. And we don't have any questions that have come in yet. Anybody have one? You can unmute yourself if you like, or put it in the chat. Okay. I'd say go ahead and move on. We will move on. Think about your questions, please. And we'll have <laughs> question time as I complete uh, in 20 minutes or so. So what is baleage? Uh, baleage is baled forage and it's wrapped with plastic immediately, immediately after baling and then it's preserved as, as a forage, as preserved uh, fermented forage. Uh, this is a great way to, to make quality forage when conditions do not permit the making of dry hay. And so this is the major advantage as far as I'm concerned. It's one of the tools in the so-called toolkit that we have. And in my toolbox, uh, I've got things like the mower conditioner. We talked about with making hay, a, a wide swath, uh, may have a tether, uh, timely raking is gonna be important the possibility of use of preservative uh, like propionic uh, acid um, when weather conditions can be uh, a concern. But then we can also add to that, and, and many people have in the last 20 years, uh, added the tool of a wrapper. And um, this has been, I think, extremely uh, helpful, particularly for people that do the process correctly. And that's what we're gonna spend the rest of uh, our hour on is how do you make about making baleage correctly? But it does better manage the weather factor. And so out of this particular publication here of the North Central Region, the probability of no rain, May 17 to 23, and I selected that particular week as a week that probably is a good compromise for first quality cutting in Northern Indiana as compared to Southern Indiana. But for three consecutive dry days, the chances of that have been proven to be about 55%. Now, if you can get that down to two consecutive dry days, that elevates to 74%. Thus, we can think about making uh, more baleage more effectively in a, in a two day period, which is very, very difficult to do, particularly in the month of May of thinking that we're gonna take a crop that's 75% moisture and we cut it, get it to the safe 20% moisture, we can essentially wilt our crop over the course of a day or day and a half, probably down to that 50% where we'd like to be with baleage and then get it wrapped and then let mother nature have its rain a, a day later. Uh, whereas hay in the swath is probably gonna get a bath. Um, so this also can result in an increase in forage quality as compared to, to dry hay. And therefore, because it is higher quality, we can reduce our expenses associated with uh, the purchase of supplements to improve the quality of the forage as compared to um, the dry hay, which uh, is gonna be a little less quality potentially. I wanna share with you some data that uh, Jason Tower, who's the superintendent at the Southern Indiana Purdue Ag Center did uh, several years ago, but it really, I think does a real fair and a good assessment of the advantage of the quality of baleage that one might have as compared to making hay without rain. And if you were to get a rainfall 
of, in this case, it was one and a quarter inches of rain in that event. So dry matter content, uh, pretty typical that we're gonna find for hay and storage is in this range and dry matter percent right on target. He did a good job of getting the moisture to be in that 50 to 60% range for baleage. Uh, the protein content was a little bit higher in the baleage, probably because you're retaining more leaf matter, okay, particularly of the legumes that might be a component. And this was a tall fescue red clover forage and uh, that we're looking at in terms of uh, being dry or rained upon or made as baleage. Total digestible nutrients, and you know people talk about TDN, that stands for total digestible nutrients, was higher as you can see with the baleage, a lower as with the rained upon crop as compared to the dry crop. The relative feed value, which is a relative measure of forage quality, it's been suggested that a value of 100, which is not the top value, a uh, relative feed value of 100 would be like mature alfalfa hay. Uh, in this particular study, we found that the baleage was at 94, uh, a quarter inch was quite a bit reduced at 64, and the dry hay was intermediate. Let me just say that there is really a better term that should be used now by laboratories and shared with us. A relative feed value was meant to be uh, done strictly with alfalfa, but it kind of emerged into all forages of the world. And we know that that undervalues uh, grasses, particularly warm season grasses. So what laboratories are evolving to now is called relative forage quality, RFQ. Um, NDF is neutral detergent fiber. And that's a situation that the higher the number, the more fiber there is in the crop, which means that consumption is gonna be lesser as compared to a lower NDF. So we have the low NDF with the baleage and we have the highest amount of fiber with the quarter, one and a quarter inches of rain. And again, the dry hay was intermediate. Now this is a, a really very high uh, NDF. We're getting close to straw kind of quality there, which means that we lost the uh, solubles, uh, the simple sugars, uh, um, some of the soluble minerals are also lost in this process of leaching into the soil from the impact of the rain filtering to that through that hay crop. Uh, net energy of maintenance is what this is uh, measured as megacalories per pound. And again, we can see that the quality of the baleage was superior to that of the dry forage as compared to that which was rained upon. Now, by looking at this, one may assume that uh, shoot, let's just make baleage all the way through and be done with it. Some people I think uh, do uh, have kind of taken on that, but let's keep in mind that there is a cost of that plastic uh, that one is utilizing that is uh, not found in dry hay, particularly then if that dry hay is put into some sort of storage structure such that it's not in the fence line or fence row um, being wasted as the precipitation happens through the year or years. Um, so, you know, I think to wrap a bale, the last I'd probably checked was around uh, seven, seven to eight dollars, probably expense in plastic. And uh, typically there's going to be only about uh, in the neighborhood, probably of uh, 700 pounds, 800 pounds of dry matter. So that's a pretty expense, pretty big expense, as you can look at the uh, amount of expense per ton that you're investing in the baleage. But on the other hand, as a weather beater, as compared to keeping quality, as compared to losing something like we might have in this particular case with the rained upon forage, uh, that's I think where it kicks into play as part of my tool in that toolbox. So other advantages. Uh, the other advantages that we have is that uh, the storage loss is certainly gonna be less as compared to having that uh, hay bale stored directly on the soil. Um, and having a decomposition occur at that level. Of course, there's things that we can do uh, with, uh, um, with pad in terms of, a, of the right kind of pad in terms of crushed rock on top and allowing water to filtrate through uh, geotextile type of cloth. So uh, there are ways that we can reduce hay uh, that is dry on a, on a surface as well, but Certainly as compared to on the ground, that's gonna be a lesser amount of waste when we have it uh, in the form of baleage as compared to dry hay, less than properly stored. And again, the trips across the field, such as this tedding uh, that we're showing in this picture here and the raking down here. Um, 
you know, in the right environmental conditions, those can be minimized and certainly they do have some cost associated with them. Now, one thing that I wanna stress is because when we had these botulism issues that showed up with baleage, um, one of the things that really came out is the fact that we had a high amount of ash content. And what this means is there's always gonna be ash in hay. Uh, that would be if we were to take a sample and combust it, what's left? And what's left are the minerals, okay? Uh, we expect there to be minerals. On the other hand, if we have a lot of soil that was put into the windrow because we were aggressive, we were essentially moving soil about with the tether or with the raking operation, or in one particular case, I'm convinced that the soil was wet the tractor as it was going through the field was creating cleat marks that created you know, segments, and I'm sure you've all seen this, of essentially wet balls of soil that ended up in the windrow and were baled. That creates high ash content. Uh, soil is you know, lots of minerals, of course. And so in the case of, of, of a problem of this one individual, the ash content of that baleage was 11% on a dry matter basis. A typical level is going to be more like 6%, so roughly a doubling of the amount of soil, and that can cause problems with, with fermentation and the possibility of clostridium, which is a soil-borne bacteria that causes um, botulism to occur. So keep that in mind. Uh, don't be so aggressive that you're getting soil uh, into the windrow before making baleage. Now, what are the trade-offs? Well, more bales have to be made as there's less dry matter in each bale, okay? So we might be making uh, hay at a safe moisture content of 19%. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we're making baleage at somewhere around 50% moisture. So there's a lot more moisture in each of those bales. And then plastic disposal is another thing you're gonna have to deal with and, and work through and uh, Bales should be fed within a year of harvest. And here's a, a situation, as you can see here, we've got uh, a bale that's been there probably for three years or more. The plastic's deteriorated, the hay's becoming compost. Uh, I'm a little bit amused by this. We've got curly dock growing and we're actually seeing a curly dock uh, utilizing the, uh, the composted hay as, as a soil resource. So we don't wanna have this type of activity occurring. Uh, so we need to be utilizing these bales within a year of wrapping. So let's talk about the uh, different types of equipment that we can use. And we've got the platform wrapper uh, that I'm showing here. And then we've got the inline tuber that uh, I'm seeing here. So the platform wrapper as compared to an inline tuber, there's gonna be less initial expense. Uh, the bales are transportable. You have to be careful, of course, not to poke holes in them as they're transported, but um, they can be transported individually as compared to that tube, which obviously is going to be, you know, frankly, impossible to uh, safely move that along. And I don't know if anybody wanted to have the expense of unwrapping and wrapping again. Um, less spoilage loss. Uh, if you have a rip in the tube, You've got several bales that may be influenced by that rip in terms of now providing oxygen that can uh, cause decomposition of that uh, forage to occur. Uh, we've got more plastic cost, uh, however, with the platform wrapper as compared to the inline tube wrapper. And um, also um, um, less time to wrap a bale as compared to uh, the others. So, and I'm gonna make a change there. There actually be more time to wrap a bale uh, there with the platform wrappers. So more time to wrap a bale as compared to the one that's in, in the inline tube. So what are the principles to success? And this is what I wanna talk about now for the next 10 minutes. These are really, really critical to have all of these done properly. Otherwise you're gonna get yourself into some potential problems and disappointed with the end product. You need crop quality, you need the right moisture content, the right density of bale, the right bale shape. Uh, the time between baling's gotta be close to immediate um, and, and wrapping uh, the right binding material, uh, content co information about the plastic itself, uh, where we store them and then the feeding. 
So crop quality. Well, good fermentation is truly dependent upon the right supply of fermentable carbohydrates, which are simple sugars and starches. If you know the story of Rumpelstiltskin, you know that uh, the story is that he could take straw and he could spin it into gold. Uh, you're not going to take straw and spin it into alfalfa hay by making baleage. Don't think that you're going to have that sort of thing happen. You can't take something that's of poor quality and create something that's superior quality with a fermentation process. And uh, remember that uh, the expense of wrapping a large round bale, whether it's uh, good quality or poor quality, uh, the expense of the plastic and, and the wrapping cost is going to be similar. So you're putting a lot more percentage of the dollar uh, into plastic in terms of value of the crop if it's poor quality as compared to if it's a higher quality forage. The moisture content, again, I've alluded to uh, 50%, 50 to 60% is the target. If we were to go out and cut forage and were to measure it, you're going to find it's going to be around 75 to 78% moisture, okay, growing in the field. And so the goal is to get that wilted down to 50 to 60%. And typically, uh, it's going to be six to 24 hours to reach the ideal moisture content. Of course, all of that's dependent upon uh, temperature, wind, um, moisture content of the soil that you're laying the crop upon, uh, solar radiation in terms of intensity, whether it's cloudy or a bright, clear day. Uh, so all of these factors go into whether it's going to be several hours or many hours. So we got to be on top of this. And uh, what I'm showing here is a, is a forced air um, oven, okay? Um, it's uh, about the size, oh gosh, probably about the size of a big oatmeal uh, cereal container. And uh, this is the oven part, blows air through. We've weighed out the forage that is here on a screen. Weigh this apparatus, uh, know the beginning weight, know the, the final weight as it's going through, and we can calculate the percentage of moisture to target that we're correct. Okay. Also, welding time will be dependent upon the type of crop, whether we have a high yield or a low yield and uh, the swath density that we've made because a dense swath is gonna dry more slowly as compared to a thin swath. So we want a dense tight bale so that we can exclude oxygen. And we know, as we said, that proper fermentation does require that anaerobic environment. So we want oxygen out of there. So we want a dense and tight bale. Bale should have similar outer dimensions and I violated <laughs> that recommendation, did I not, with this inline tube wrapper. Uh, this actually was a picture I took at a field day at the Southern Indiana Purdue Ag Center, where we had A through Z almost type of bale wrappers. And so we brought them to the inline uh, wrapper to uh, show folks how this apparatus works. And we've got little bales, we've got moderate sized bales, and we've got big bales, and we've got monster bales. And uh, as a result, this up and down type of motion here is not what you want. You want them to be as uniform as possible in size, uh, such that we don't have pockets of air in between a small bale and a large bale. As we stated, bales should be wrapped as soon as possible, ideally within four hours. I want to share a story with you. Uh, first time I ever was part of uh, exhibiting uh, a wrapper for an industry member at one of our field days. Uh, we thought we were maybe doing the right thing, uh, using our time wisely. So at four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, one of the um, people went out and wrapped, or I'm sorry, went out and made a bale, just went out and made a large round bale. And there it sat uh, from late afternoon. And when we came back in the early morning, uh, that bale looked more like an egg, okay? And uh, not really knowing, um, we... <laughs> We went ahead and wrapped that bale. We probably did more damage to the wrapping industry at that point because the wrapper really was not working all that well for something that looked like an egg as compared to something that was a cylinder. And um, so really, really important that we utilize, uh, make sure that these bales don't squat down, okay, to start looking like an egg as they set. We really wanna be doing this as quickly as possible after they are baled. We need to use plastic twine, 
untreated sisal twine or plastic net wrapping. Uh, the treated twine actually can cause some deterioration of the plastic. So make sure that you're utilizing the right type of bale binding. You have choices, but avoid the treated sisal twine. We wanna tightly wrap each bale. We like to be excellent quality plastic that's one mil thick, six to eight layers. Uh, that then, uh, of course, we want plastic that resistant to sunlight so that we can at least get a, a year of preservation out of uh, the wrap that we purchase. Storage should be on a well-drained site, okay? Don't put it down in the holler. Um, inspect the bales for the presence of holes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, wildlife can come along, uh, maybe a, a some branch came, came down, although I wouldn't be storing these under trees, but some sort of hole is gonna happen. Patch the holes with the UV light uh, protected plastic tape that the manufacturer uh, where you purchase the plastic will have. Don't be utilizing that duct tape uh, because uh, it's at some point gonna deteriorate and oxygen air will get into the bale and cause decomposition to occur. And I'm going to give you a tidbit um, of information. Uh, the things we learn from one another are fantastic. And uh, I'm going to share this particular story. Uh, one of the users of uh, large round bales being wrapped was having problems with hawks. And the hawks would come down. And if you look closely in this picture, you can see that this hawk's going to have a nice, nice meal of a rodent. And the talons were wrapped, were actually causing holes into the bale on this particular end because these bales were flipped, okay, 90 degrees, and as you typically see them in the field. But there weren't enough wraps that the talons were still going into the bale and was causing miniature holes everywhere, and there was bale deterioration happening. So what the farmer learned is that if you put these up on end, there's about double the number of wraps here and the talons could not go through the double wrapping. So everybody was happy, uh, except the rodent. Uh, the hawk could have its meal and uh, you know the dairy farmer in this case uh, could have better quality baleage. I'm gonna reemphasize the feeding time, uh, utilize those bales within a year. Uh, run wrap the plastic on the bale. It's just as you begin to feed it to the livestock. And just in summary here, you know, we have learned that there's a right way, there's a less right way, there's a wrong way to making these, uh, these bales, and um, as well as chop forage. And uh, we want to avoid poor fermentation, and we can do so by harvesting, uh, by utilizing the right harvest guidelines. So, uh, with that, if you have some questions, I'd uh, really like to take the next uh, 15 minutes and have conversation with you about uh, comments I made or anything else. And um, so let's have it. All right, fantastic. So before we start on questions real quick, because I forgot it last week, um, you guys could work on this poll while we start going through some of the questions. I'd appreciate it. So. All right, Keith, first question we have, would you produce both dry hay and baleage on an operation? Within a farm, within a farm is that what we're saying, I assume? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yes, I would, I'd, I'd have that option. If, uh, if the resource dollars are there to have that wrapper um, and the acreage is there to justify it, that would be one of my tools in that toolbox. However, I'm not one that thinks I have to wrap everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can definitely say that there is a bit better quality, uh, probably in bale product, although there's also risk because sometimes when you unwrap those bales, you can have a bit of a surprise and a disappointment. Uh, maybe a bit of scummy uh, sort of uh, molds on the surface that one has to deal with. Thankfully, most of those tend not to be uh, mycotoxins, but it's uh, some that could be. So we have that particular issue. But, you know, when I'm in a situation that it's uh, May the 20 and um, the weather conditions look poor, the soils are wet now, uh, it could be two weeks before I harvest that crop with as dry hay. Um, 
yeah, I, I'm, and I got two days to get it done, I'm gonna be making baleage. Because what that does is we've got better quality as compared to waiting that two weeks um, as it's gonna mature and have lesser quality. Um, the moisture that is in the soil uh, that we get is gonna grow a good second crop instead of a more mature first crop. Uh, I think you're guaranteed then probably to have a better second crop. You know, there are some people that essentially say, uh, when it's time to cut, cut the hay um, and bear the consequences, you know? Uh, my concern with that is uh, if those that you're on last week, if you recall the video uh, where an individual went out into the field and he created pathway of tire, tire marks, well, he paid the price for that uh, approach um, because uh, essentially, you know, he had situations that were there for him the rest of the time that forage was there. So, uh, yes, I uh, think if uh, the resource dollars are there and uh, that to have the opportunity at least or to do uh, contract business with somebody, uh, you may not own the wrapper yourself, but to have that relationship with somebody that owns the wrapper and is doing it at a reasonable price, um, yes. Second question, what forages are more desirable for baleage? Okay, um, I think we can utilize all that I stated successfully if we follow the tips. So the ones that I think about are the cool season grasses that are adapted. Um, so, you know, here in the Midwest region, we'd be looking at things like orchard grass, uh, tall fescue, timothy, uh, ryegrass, um, legume wise, uh, you know, those that typically are, are utilized again, uh, we can do that with alfalfa or red clover. Um, we can look at bird's foot trefoil uh, as well. Um, typically not as a hay crop, but, uh, you know, essentially a blend of cool season grasses and legumes. Uh, we can take small grains. Uh, there are a fair number of people that harvest, uh, winter wheat that now is probably uh, in some locations of the state, uh, six to eight inches tall and some er other areas, maybe only three or four, depending on latitude that you're at. Letting that get uh, to a situation pre-pollination, uh, that can make a very good, uh, good crop. Uh, winter rye uh, could, could be made into that as well. So your small grains that are adapted. And then lastly, uh, you know, your summer annual grasses like sorghum sedan grass, and Sudan grass and pearl millet. So a broad array, frankly, uh, but you've got to follow the protocol. You've got to harvest in timely fashion. You don't want to be uh, trying to think you're going to create uh, something that can ferment well if it's harvested uh, too mature. Right. So would the advantages in nutrition, so baleage versus dry hay, still hold true in a beef operation? State it again, please. Yep. Would the advantages in nutrition, so when we're looking at baleage versus dry hay, um, would that still hold in a beef operation? Because you had mentioned about the dairy operation. Yeah, sure. Mileage, yes, it would so. cross all livestock operations. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Then how does baleage compare to dry hay stored in a barn off the ground? Okay. Um, you're going to find that probably there's still going to be a little bit of increase uh, quality potential in baleage. But again, my caution is consider the cost that you go into with all that plastic, okay? Because if you're not careful, you can have more cost in the plastic than the value of, of the little bit of supplement that it might take to get the quality to be similar. So yeah, I uh, definitely uh, storage of hay uh, in the right ways, important. Um, you know, high quality hay ought to have cover on it. Um, minimally, I would say if hay is going to be utilized relatively quickly, it's been documented that the net wrapping does save about two to three, maybe 4% dry matter, less loss as compared to twine. So there's some advantage there. Uh, if you do store outside, one of the things I don't see often, and we should, and uh, I wasn't probably communicating very well is that outside storage of hay, to me, should be dedicated in a well-drained spot um, out of the tree line. Uh, it ought to have a situation where we've got uh, 
geotextile cloth, landscape, good, good landscaping cloth that can take water down. And then you've got uh, coarse rock, okay, as the surface, real coarse rock. And essentially what that allows is it breaks the interface of the bale with the soil and moisture can go down through that rock and through that geotextile cloth. Uh, that's a very, very effective way to reduce deterioration uh, at the bale soil interface layer. Frankly, you have more loss at the bale soil interface layer than you do on the that which is above ground and not touching the soil. All right, great. All right, should I avoid feeding the end bales on an inline wrap? Well, there's some tricks that people have done there to uh, reduce that. Some people will actually uh, put a dry bale uh, of hay and, and have that as the bale. So it's got, if you will, an interface there of at least dry uh, as compared to starting with a wet bale. The other thing that you can do is you can purchase end caps. And so it's essentially a big square of plastic that's kind of a starter and you can reduce the amount of loss then as compared to it being open to the atmosphere, you can purchase those big plastics, it's gonna reduce the possibility. So, you know, it sounds like somebody's had some uh, visual that has not been pleasing to them. And yes, that first, first bail in particular can be the least pleasing. You know, I think you take that on a, on a case by case basis. And if it's really deteriorated, yeah, I'll probably take a pitchfork and try to separate out separate it out to be safe and, uh, you know, utilize it as organic fertilizer somewhere where nutrients are needed. All right. If you are going to rake hay being made into baleage, how far in advance do you start raking in front of the baler? Okay. And, and again, um, Keep, keep in mind that there are times if you have five days of, you know, uh, well, not even that because you have five days, you gotta make and dry hay. But uh, if you have a, a couple of days that you think you can get it to the stage that you don't have to lay it wide, don't. But uh, probably in most cases, people are gonna lay it into a swath and do some raking. Um, I would probably start raking when the moisture contents uh, around 60% in this particular case. Uh, again, standing crop is gonna be about 75 to 78%. Uh, the ideal target is 50 to 60%. Um, you're not gonna have much loss of leaves at a 60% moisture, but you're in the process of getting it ready to go. So somewhere around that particular level is where I would start, start uh, Ranking and, and that again is all dependent on the environmental conditions that you have and the, the, the crop yield that you have. I can't give you a specific number of hours. Okay, that's just impossible to do because all those factors play into it, particularly environmental factors. So uh, I'd probably start raking around 60%. So along those lines, what just came to mind when mm -hmm. you're mowing with the idea of making baleage and you know it's going to be a warmer, drier day, would it be better to set your swath width a little bit narrower when you're sure. harvesting just so you don't have to go into the raking? Or is it better to do the wide? No, I think uh, no, thinking that you can get that done within uh, the time frame without a, a rainfall incident, yes, you can leave that in a, in a narrower swath as compared to the full width. Okay. Again, you and know, then do you yeah, what, you know, again, going back to this whole soil thing, you know, the less manipulation you can have, the, the lesser chance you're going to get soil in there that's going to cause potentially problems with fermentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so less okay. manipulation, less contaminant. All right. And then do haylage bales spoil as the air temperatures increase? Do baleage bales spoil as air temperature increases? Is that the question? Yes. No, you wouldn't expect that if you can keep the oxygen out. Um, that's the whole key uh, is making sure that, uh, you know, that happens. Um, you know, so if you're thinking that this is going to be a storage that's uh, greater than a year, um, 
that's where you're going to start seeing the problems and the breakdown. So, you know, sure, heat's and, and solar radiation is going to have greater effect on the breakdown of that uh, UV protection and that plastic. Uh, there's no doubt about that as compared to cloudy, cloudy event, event type of days um, that are less solar radiated. Um, but just to think it's temperature related, I don't think, I don't think that's going to be a, the case. All right. Well, those are all the questions we have for now. Okay. Any others? Okay. Well, feel free to uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about things and with your extension educators. And uh, I hope the series has been helpful to many of you. And uh, again, uh, last week I said I'd hold on. My battery uh, imploded uh, <laughs> at just the right time, frankly, if it was going to. But if any of you have questions, I'm willing to hang on here if you do have uh, uh, questions that you want to ask of me personally. Oh, we had another one that came in. So, Good. How much lead time should we plan when deciding whether to bale dry or to wrap? The day, I, the minute I cut <laughs> that, I'm thinking about that. Um, yeah, so it's one of those things that if you're leasing the equipment, you need to have conversation and say, hey, there's a, I'm laying my crop down. Are you available in case this thing changes? Um, I would have that conversation with the individual that has the uh, wrapper that you might be uh, leasing uh, their help with, uh, be in communication with them. But uh, in those times where it's uh, could go one way or the other, just depending on what that second or third day does, I'd be thinking about that all the time ready to go. And when it gets to be uh, minimally 50% moisture, you make the decision. Whether you, you look at it at that time says, man, to make a quality crop, I've got to wrap it now because if it gets down to 30% moisture, you're not going to have as good a fermentation. And I know people that have stretched this. I know people that have wrapped these products at 35% and um, haven't had serious wrecks with what they've done, but that wreck is a potential. Uh, the other thing is that you're going to get uh, some heating of that forage and have that uh, those simple carbohydrates bound to protein and have less available protein that could happen at less than ideal. So um, yeah, that's, that's my response. So basically checking that weather before you cut, as you're cutting, after you're cutting and another 24 hours later, basically. Yep. And, and again, if, if you're not utilizing your own equipment, communicate when you're going to lay the crop down and they would be available at a two hour notice. <laughs> All right, and then how do you determine moisture content when the crop is laying in the windrow? Okay. Would that be the squeeze test that you recommended? Could you do that on baleage as well or just the silage? Really, the uh, whole squeeze test works well with chop crop. Um, there are techniques one can use. Uh, you've got to go into the windrow and um, try to be representative as possible, essentially take a length and then you chop it into segments, um, you know, that might be two to three inches long. And then you take them to, uh, you know, the, the microwave technique, you take them to the little air, air forced air oven that I showed you, uh, or you take them to, um, you know, the Penn State uh, apparatus that utilizes PVC pipe and hairdryer. Okay, there are these different options. The other thing that, um, uh, some particular companies have that you can do is they've got um, oh a unit that is on a cord and it's about the size uh, three or four inches across and it's got uh, electrodes that come down little electrodes and you can um, put that into the swath and it will give you a reading uh, electronically uh, and that can get you into range as well, but that's another option. Probably not as 
reliable is taking the time to get the more representative sample maybe, but uh, some of these hay probes that have an actual hard probe will actually actually come in then with one of these units that have the electrodes as a component that you can purchase as well. That's a good question. All of them have been good questions. All right, that's what we have for now. So just again, another reminder, another plug for our Grazing 102 school coming up in June that we talked about last week. So if you're interested in learning more about grazing, which we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks, um, certainly sign up for those schools. We don't have registration completed yet, but we're getting there. Yeah, the so. flyers are close to being created and developed at this point, so <laughs> we're, we're moving along. All right, fantastic. So. Again, thank you everybody for attending today, for taking a little time out of your day to be with us. We appreciate it. And if there are any other questions, we can stay on. Otherwise, enjoy your Friday. Hopefully it warms up a little bit, so. All right. Can you hang on, Alicia? Okay. All right, thank you everybody and have a good weekend.